Okay. We'll now call this regular workshop meeting of the City Council to order. And you, uh, you have a copy of the agenda uh, at your places here. Uh, and I guess the first thing I will do is ask uh, for a motion to adopt the proposed agenda. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Hearing on all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Now work, we have three workshop topics on, on the agenda for tonight. We're going to start with the economic development update. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to ask Ron Massey, the deputy manager, to introduce this. As you know, Ron has taken on the responsibility over the many years of being our liaison to economic development. He does an outstanding job of working with Sheila and with Mark. I'd like for Ron to make some initial comments, please. <clears throat> Mayor and Council, thank you, uh, Richard. We uh, have a good opportunity tonight as the uh, Joe Ed, Jones Onslow, or jo <laughs> Jones, yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Jacksonville <laughs> Onslow Economic Development uh, Corporation is going into their strategic planning. And I know there's been some questions on some of the part of the council members on, <clears throat> you know, what kind of activities uh, Joe Ed's involved in. And uh, so this is an opportunity to get a little overview of, of what's going to happen here in the new future, near future with the strategic planning effort and to ask any questions about some of the activities and also then hopefully participate in the strategic planning process. So we've got Sheila and Mark and Teresa mm -hmm. uh, here from Joe Ed to uh, go through uh, an update. So go ahead. Uh, this sign mm -hmm. advances the slides. Okay, thank you. And that is exactly why we have branded ourselves Joe Ed, to uh, kind of make that less of a mouthful and a little bit easier to remember. So, but the J does stand for Jacksonville, Jacksonville Wonsley Economic Development. Thank you, Mayor Phillips and the council members for having us here today. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to get to tell you a little bit about where we've been and most importantly, a little bit about some where we have some opportunities to go here shortly. And thank you for introducing our team, Ron. Um, Mark, Teresa, and I now make the three-legged stool of Joe Ed, and I uh, believe you probably got the best team you've had on board for quite some while. We've got a lot of energy and a lot of opportunity and a lot of exciting um, ideas ahead of us. Um, I do believe that uh, all of you are familiar with the fact that uh, uh, Joe Ed is also referred to as the Committee of 100 for years, obviously because of the, the private sector investment and involvement in, in our organization, and that uh, our goal basically is to promote economic growth in Jacksonville and Onslow County and all the other municipalities. We strive to do this through the, uh, basically re business recruitment and also to assist in the retention and expansion of our existing industries, which will help them create jobs and hopefully increase their capital investment in our community, creating tax dollars. We are in the process of completing a five-year strategic plan that our organization, with you, uh, approved um, now going on almost five years ago. It had four main strategic um, uh, functions. One was marketing and outreach. That basically was about positioning us um, with regional and state developers, as well as industry site selectors and prospects to um, make them aware of the assets of Jacksonville and Onslow County. Uh, to basically put a face on us and to let them know that we were open and wanting to do business. Our board at that time, um, about seven or eight years ago, felt that we had kind of lost a little touch with some of the main economic development partners in the state and the region and wanted us to embrace that again. I can honestly tell you that we feel that we have strongly um, completed that uh, task and are very well positioned to be competitive um, because we are now well known with our regional and state economic developers. The second strategy was market and asset development. Quite frankly, as my father always used to tell me, you can't sell from an empty wagon. So we were tasked with making sure that we identified the available product that we had in our community that we could go and then market. And then also to help with product development when we saw there were voids that we needed to, um, to fill. Uh, workforce is an ongoing initiative that we involve ourselves in, and we envision that probably uh, in the next few years uh, we are going to get a little bit deeper in workforce development, our identification and marketing of that um, as the labor force is becoming more and more competitive as we're finding in economic development uh, realms, and also investigating some uh, 
kind of grow grow your own opportunities in our community. We think that's going to be a topic of a conversation in our next uh, few few sessions. And of course, organizational and regulatory. It's about housekeeping and trying to expand the capacity of JOED so that we can uh, continue to do more with the resources we have. Uh, like I said, we are wrapping that up. We're getting ready to start a new strategic planning um, opportunity, and Mark's going to talk about that in, in just a moment. One of the questions we often get um, in our day-to-day -day activities is what type of uh, request do we get? Uh, we track all leads that come into our organization, all bona fide leads that come into our organization. They come from a variety of sources. They can either come from uh, JOED um, uh, sources or they come from our regional and state um, economic development organizations that are out there also uh, uh, farming for prospects. So we track them on a variety of types, but one of the things that we try to keep uh, an eye on is what they're asking for. Um, and you'll see out of the year-to-date lead requests that we've had of um, 74, and I apologize, there's a typo on this, there is uh, supposed to be 74. Ten of those have been for land requests. 64 of those have been for building requests. Um, so you can kind of see the relationship of why it's so important for us to identify inventory and have inventory available. That stays pretty true to form. That's about an 80 per six, 86 percent of building um, to uh, building ratio request, um, and it typically runs about 75 to 93 percent year over year in terms of the, the request. Another Thing that we track is what industry segment, segments are being represented in these requests. Um, in this particular chart, you'll see that overwhelming manufacturing is the, the highest request that we get. That's not unusual. That matches state numbers as well. Um, the food and beverage inquiries have increased lately. We've been um, very interested in those because we do feel that we have an opportunity to participate in maybe some of the third and fourth tier food and beverage um, uh, markets, also uh, expanding out into even some agribusiness opportunities. Um, obviously, uh, Jacksonville has been a home to many call centers, inbound customer service call centers, and we do have a tendency to get quite a few of those inquiries, as well as some um, smaller or mid-level distribution inquiries. Uh, the others are just miscellaneous things. Um, one of them could be a document scanning company. Another one was a lifestyle type of uh, inquiry or something that we actually, um, or another could have been one that we absolutely couldn't identify. So this is two of the ways that we try to track all of the requests that we get coming into our market. We also try to identify those that we think we absolutely have an opportunity to fulfill um, and then we certainly try to answer as many of these requests as possible, trying to stay in the pipeline to be for consideration um, for their um, uh, location or expansion of their business. Um, one of the questions that was asked, I believe, uh, and you may notice on here, is that we don't have a tendency to get many retail requests, and that's just that's not unusual given the fact that we are considered a traditional economic development organization, but we do work with the, uh, the, the retail market in, in Oslo County, maybe not through direct prospecting or recruiting, but we work with a lot of the developers as they're looking to recruit into their shopping centers. Most of those do their own recruiting. They know what kind of mix they want in those shopping centers. Um, we do keep an eye on any large empty buildings to see if there's alternative uses that would be applicable within city limits based on zoning and, of course, based on the shopping center and their restrictions in terms of what they would allow so that we could, um, you know, try to offer opportunities for those buildings if that were if that were there. Um, we don't typically uh, get too involved in any tourism activities other than to utilize our tourism assets in our marketplace when we're recruiting and trying to share quality of life opportunities with people who express an interest in coming to our market. And as Lorette and I often talk about as Commerce Center partners, we try to certainly collaborate between economic, traditional economic development, JOED, the Chamber, sports and tourism, but try not to be redundant, or certainly not competitive, but to collaborate where we can. We've had a couple of uh, exciting announcements and opportunities over the past year. Um, 
uh, although U.S. Workboats is not new to our community, they did have a pretty good growth opportunity last year. Uh, they actually went from 15 to about 58 workers. So when you do the math, that's like a new small business that came to town and has grown. And we're very proud of that. And of course, I don't try to miss an opportunity to share how proud we are that they are now building the new uh, Department of Transportation passenger ferry, the first passenger ferry that will be built in the state of North Carolina and will be launched in about March of this year. Stay tuned. We will have a party. Also, we're very excited about winter custom yachts that also came down into Onslow County, fully moved down here last year, and they are now up to about 38 employees since they've moved here. They brought five employees with them, and they're up to about 38. So there's new jobs that have been created from our community. Onslow Bay Boat Works will be relocating later here, later this year here. We're hoping to have a groundbreaking, hopefully within the next 30 or so days. Um, they will be coming in with about 15 established jobs and creating another 24 very shortly thereafter. So there's another growth opportunity that we're looking forward to. And of course, contact us, a new call center that moved uh, just outside of um, about the Freedom Village area just last summer is now up to about 200 employees. So zero to 200 very quickly, customer inbound call center. They're doing very well and we've appreciated the city of Jacksonville's um, assistance on a few items that we needed needed there. So we're very excited uh, about some growth opportunities that we've had um, in addition to the existing businesses in our community that we work hard to help uh, grow their business. Uh, we're very excited about some of the new growth opportunities that we think are uh, available to us. And I'm going to ask Mark to share with you some opportunities that we think are going to be of particular interest to you and why it's so important that we have you at the table with us this year. Mr. Mark. I am. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thanks uh, for having us over again. Uh, our, uh, our immediate uh, overarching task ahead of us this spring is the development of our next five year work plan and uh, which we will finish in June. And like, like the slide says, this isn't about, uh, about what Joe Ed is going to be in five years and how we're going to get there. It's about where this community, where the investors in Joe Ed, uh, the city and the towns and the county and all the other investors in Joe Ed envision our community being in five years, how we're going to get there what resources we're going to use to get there and how we're going to measure our success along the way. Uh, and I can't imagine the city not being there as a, as a loud, regular and decisive voice in that conversation. I mean, um, city uh, is like I say, is, like the slide says, it's not just our economic center of gravity. It's our political and governmental and educational and, and employment center of gravity for Onslow County. And I, uh, it's just a statistic I ran across the other day. I didn't realize 29,000 folks came into town to work every day. And uh, that's about 42% of the jobs in this town. But something, uh, and so we've done this for decades, right? This partnership, but there's something new and there's something exciting in these opportunity zones that I know Ron's heard me talk about. You guys talked about opportunity yes, zones yeah. in detail? Not with the council. Just with the staff. Okay. Okay. So uh, I only have a couple minutes here, and that's what I want to talk about. Is this? The, I think these these opportunity zones, and especially the one census tract that is both an opportunity and a hub zone, are going to be one of the three or four strategic goals of this upcoming Joe Ed plan that we really need to elaborate on. I think they're economic development assets. Uh, that uh, open up an enti entirely new um, looks into the future about what we can all do together. And as you can see, as you can't see, as you can now, there they are. They're both, and both opportunity zones have elements of your, of your city limits, your ETJ, and the counties. So uh, the one on the right is also a hub zone. So these, these opportunity zones were created as part, part of the big tax reform bill, the latter part of 2017. Uh, it came from a, thought, a think tank called the Economic Innovation Group. The idea has been stirring for 15 years. It had the rare bipartisan support uh, across both aisles for the adoption of this. And it was hiding out in that tax reform act as kind of an Easter egg. And uh, what, what happened was they, the, they cre the, the purpose of this is to stimulate private sector investment in these certain census tracts and to uh, 
the criteria is in that census tract, you have to have a, uh, a poverty rate in excess of 20% or a median household income that's less than 80% of the state's average. Now, there were 1,008 of these across North Carolina, but the federal government only allowed the states to down select, or they, they required them to down select to 25% of those. So North Carolina's share nationally was 252. Two of them are in Onslow. All of the counties have at least one of these opportunity zones, and those are, are ours. Uh, and they were certified by the Treasury Department last, last May. Uh, and then nothing really happened because that wasn't a, a vehicle for moving money. It was just a geographical designation. And about six months later, in October, November of 2018, the Department of the Treasury issued a couple of new tax rules to govern how this is going to work, how money can, can flow in here, incentivized by freedom from capital gains taxes, okay? So, so that, that's the, uh, the overarching plan. Uh, and and it, it laid down some rules by which an opportunity fund could be created. So physically you have a zone, functionally you have opportunity funds that deploy, like any investment fund, they're gonna deploy venture capital into these opportunity zones for, for housing or for uh, a spec, you know, economic development, for infrastructure, for, for transportation, for... Uh, uh, Retail and hospitality. Hotel, hospitality, yeah, all that stuff, whatever, whatever. But the, when the when the fund invests in the opportunity zone, it becomes that that money becomes free from capital gains tax. So, I'm going to show you a slide in a second on how that would work for an individual and what would compel them to invest there. But um, I looked up, I looked it up just yesterday. The latest count is 61 of these opportunity funds have been created around the country already. And the policy came out in October, November. And so they look a lot like what you're used to seeing with the Rockefeller Foundation or Kresge Foundation. They're very interested in affordable housing, right? That's their investment strategy. And one of the program goals is to take a certain chunk of their resources and put it into opportunity funds. But a bunch of other opportunity funds came up with their own investment goals. I saw one that's just about downtown Tampa. And another one that's just about North Carolina. And I saw another one that's just about startup businesses. How do we help startup business or small businesses grow and expand within opportunity zones? I saw another one that was about locally grown salads along the I-95 growth corridor between New York and Massachusetts. And some of these things are $750 million strong. And there's some real money in these funds, but they have they have focused areas that their investors are interested in. Um, but since the inception of this a year ago, when the idea of opportunity zones was announced and then they were certified in April, or excuse me, May, the value of development sites and opportunity zones has gone up 60% as compared to 12% in development sites outside of opportunity zones. So that's a big deal and we'll come back to it in terms of how that affects tax base. But the idea is the real estate investors have a very clear idea of how this is gonna, gonna spur investment, okay, from that tax freedom. So here's what an investor would look at in a, in a pro forma. And this is a million dollar investment. Uh, and let's say this investor was just about to owe some capital gains tax in 2019. And instead of, instead of running that investment out, they pull it out of that, excuse me, pull it out of that investment, put it in an opportunity fund, and they don't have to pay the tax bill. So that happens immediately, and it starts a 10-year clock ticking. And uh, so if they stay, if they keep that investment in there for uh, five years, they get a 10% break. Another, another two years, at the end of seven years, they get another 5% break, and it doesn't come due for 10 years. And you can see at the bottom there that the same million dollars in a traditional or opportunity investment, assuming both of them perform alike, is a 40% is a greater income. Right? That's compelling. And it's why these opportunity funds are springing up. And it's why we really have an opportunity here uh, as a community. Now, 
now applied the hub zone to that and considered the impacts of the tax incentives for investing in an opportunity zone. And, 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 and I want to point out that especially the funds that are interested in housing solutions help us address one of the issues with our hub zone is there's more opportunities for housing because of course a hub zone company has to have 35% of their employees living in the hub zone or a hub zone. So that's a, so that has an overlap and compounding beneficial effect from these federal incentives and then uh, consider laying on our state and local incentives to attract that and, and done right. We're talking about accelerating job creation and private sector and investment and, and, uh, and business growth right here at home. So I think that's pretty exciting. And, uh, so, so as we're moving into the, the, the idea is moving into a strategic planning session. Uh, I truly hope that everybody, all of us and all the investors in Joe and the entities that are interested parties in this will, will, will real quickly come to the table and talk about how do we market this economic de development assets that just, that this has fallen into our laps here. And how are we going to do that uniformly and through what means and with what resources? And, uh, and then the other thing is how do we maximize, did I, did I, yeah, I mean, how, how, how do we maximize? That's what you did, Glenn, where's Glenn? Yeah, mm -hmm. split the spot, yeah. Okay, maximizing the investment. So beyond attracting businesses and creating jobs or expanding local companies, how do we, how do we weave that investment into helping with whatever issues uh, are out there with regard to infrastructure? or housing or downtown redevelopment or retail hospitality. There are opportunity funds that are only interested in one of those bullets or maybe local salads in Jacksonville. You know, seriously, uh, they, they're all over the map and they're looking for opportunity zones. We need to get our story together and we need to promote it. We need to, 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 to do it uh, by whatever means we can. So one of the things that's come up is a uh, there's a lot of information coming out in the form of conferences and websites and blogs and answering everybody's uh, hunger for, for more information on how to get rolling in this. All right, so look, uh, in conclusion, I was looking at these, at your mission, vision, and goals uh, that I found on your website. And of course, the areas that I, that I highlighted there are places where you've kind of always overlapped with uh, Joe Ed, and there's been an obvious reason for a partnership. But when I got down to looking at opportunity zones and how this, how this brings a, 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 a variety of interest to the same table that can, that can utilize these opportunity zones, uh, it, it dawned on me that it addresses six of yours. Six of your adopted goals being encouraging economic development, creating relationships to build a strong economic future, downtown redevelopment, responding to the needs and quality of life of the community, creating infrastructure for growth, and building additional relationships. So it's, it's a very compelling call to the, uh, to the table at this time while we come up with our collective vision of where we want to be in five years. So Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for allowing me time to do that. Quick question. Um, going back to the map that had the opportunity zones, how were these, how did we go about identifying those? How did, what, what did, what was done? So the, uh, so the LEAD, the Labor and Economic Analysis Division of NC Commerce said we have 1,008 of these by which, which census tracts are, meet those, one of those two criteria. And I think that's the short answer, they're census tracts. And their census tracts based upon economic conditions, uh, wages, uh, types of retail, the the amount of in income uh, that is produced from businesses. Those are the factors, among others, that were put into there. And again, uh, we talked about the opportunity zones. You also used the term of uh, hub zones. Well, a lot of people out there in TV land, the six who are listening to council workshop tonight, <laughs> may want to know what is what does the term hub zone mean? So uh, the the Small Business Administration runs a program called called the, the hub, hub Zone uh, Enterprise. So uh, it stands for Historically Underutilized Business District. Okay, and uh, 
and it's simply established by median income. That's it. There's a there's a there is a cutoff, and below that uh, median income, you are a hub zone in that census tract. Now, if you will take your business down and locate it in that hub zone, you get some benefits. You get some mentorship that doesn't cost you anything for a period of five years, and you get set aside in government contracting. So the Defense Department has a goal in most cases, in most areas, to issue 15% of their contract dollars to hub zone companies. So you get preferential treatment uh, by being a hub zone. And your requirements are your principal office has to be in a hub zone. 35% of your employees need to live in a hub zone. So I've talked to Sheila about that hub zone that you guys have for, uh, well, 10, 12 years, mm -hmm. right? And, and one of the issues was enough housing to draw businesses so their employees could live there. And that's been even back when I was working real estate and working commercial real estate and was working with companies coming to the area that wanted to locate in a hub zone. We had the hub zone and I could find them the space. They struggled to meet the housing requirement in order to fully qualify for all the other criteria. So, and of course, you know, we've known the struggle sometimes of getting some of the housing developments to be in that area. The city has been very engaged in trying to grow that area. This may be a little bit of a a boost on Mr. Magic Bullet that could help. Now the challenge obviously is the New River shopping area yep. and the New River housing area. Uh, this is not vacant property. And it's also unfortunate that these opportunities have come along at the point where the base has for all practical purposes built up. Mm -hmm. I mean if this if these designations had been here ten years ago, we might have been able to take advantage and seen a lot of redevelopment in that area but at least it is still there and maybe through cooperative efforts with the large landowners there and rezoning some property, we may be able to encourage uh, the development. As Mark said, there are incentives for, uh, for the base contracting with people who are in that hub zone. So the opportunity funds would be available to say like, you know, somebody who wanted to go in there and do a redevelopment. So how would, how would that issuance of any type of opportunity funds be made available. I mean, what would be the so so a developer comes to town or is in town. I mean, this, this could be done locally, but a developer has an idea, and the city buys into that idea. Now you need capital. Like any developer, they go looking for capital, and they can go to the opportunity funds that state that that's where their interest is. So the money is made available in chunks of. So far, there's sixty one. They range from five million bucks to seven hundred fifty million bucks, and the developer go gets venture capital to do that development. Yeah, this is not uh, federally funded. It is what I'll call uh, federally uh, federally routed money. Uh, they've set up the program. Let's take, for example, uh, the New River shopping area, or the uh, let's take the housing area over there in New River. Currently, the housing has been there for whatever fifty, sixty years. I mean. If a developer came in and said, I want to build new housing there, and I'm going to buy the New River shopping area, or the New River, I keep saying shopping, I meant the, the residential area, then they would work on putting together the new housing plan that would eliminate the housing that is there and build single family, multiple family, apartments, condominiums, whatever. They would come up with the plan and then from there, they would go out and try to find the venture capital. The reason why a person may want to invest in that from a venture capital standpoint are the tax advantages that will come to that individual. This is not like CDBG money where you're getting money from the federal government and directing. This is where individuals will decide, is that a good business investment for me? And that's, that's pretty much what happens in both of those purple areas. I think we're looking that this may, this could be the push that you need. If you've got a trend, a, a, I'll say a deal that you're putting together that doesn't quite pencil out to give the return that the investor would typically want on their money, this capital gains treatment could be what could push it over the edge to make it a, a more attractive investment. So those investors that are investing into those funds are looking for return. That's what they're looking for. The developers looking for the money. We're hoping that this could be the extra nudge that could be used to help 
incentivize, because that's what it is, incentivizing some development in areas that need it, and that was the whole purpose of it, is to try to bring it into the low wealth areas. There's a, something that happened at our board meeting when we had a presentation from a state level official with Economic Development Partnership said that the state is starting to get RFIs, requests for information about buildings or sites. And one of the questions now is, is it in an opportunity zone? Could be, a, like to Sheila's point, a decisive factor. So with the opportunity funds now, is this like a grant or is it a low interest loan or, or how is that? No, it, it, it actually doesn't work with your government. It works in support of a developer. Okay, I mean, for the developer, what, right. how would it? What we need to do is educate development community that we have, we are an opportunity zone that has assets and has needs and that's the outreach piece in the marketing that I think we need to do as a community. In a sense, you save money by not being taxed because of the gains, right. the capital gains tax. So you, you invest your money in that and over percent, it over time, it ends up being a 40% gain. Right. You only really, yeah, right. you realize right. your, your right. investment yeah. right. uh, return when you sell, right. when you sell. Right. Thank you. And, and let me make sure, you know, what we're talking about is uh, usually the city's involved in grants or loans. What this is, is investments from private money to private money under the federal regulations, with the benefit being that as a private investor, I'm now able to have certain tax breaks. And that's where the money actually comes from. And I think that's one of the values here is it's not government funded. It is government processed. It's government incentivized by letting the tax laws encourage individual investors. We believe this is one of the issues that we need to talk about during our strategic planning process to see how we can maximize this opportunity. And uh, we, uh, again, invite you, strongly encourage you to please come to the table. We will be meeting the third Thursday of each month for the next three months for four hours at the Commerce Center. Come as often and as long as you can we'll feed you a good lunch mm -hmm. but this is a partnership see this would be a great tool for you yes, to have okay. mm -hmm. definitely interested in that new river area becoming mm -hmm. more well you've all spent a lot of time and energy yeah. on that over the years mm -hmm. well so with very little success to right. be honest right. with you. I mean, where are those borders actually how far out well if, you, if I, mean, I may yeah go ahead uh, this is 17 Right. This is 24, 20. so this is basically the New River area. Piney's now, Piney's 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 on the road. Goes all the way out. Western. 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 Yeah, Western. I'm sorry. Western. 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 Ron's only been here 15 <laughs> years. He <laughs> <hasn't been laughs> here. Right. Now, coming out this way, you just cross the bridge. Here, you're going past the base. Gotcha. This is the big intersection of 53, 258, and the bypass. There's the bypass coming around. Right. right. So. Freedom Village is all in here. This is the area where the public works compound is and then going on out. So you can see, I believe Burton Park is where we're Just about right at the end the of it, there of you it. go. That's somewhere, right. somewhere out there. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Opportunity Zone runs along that power line that runs through Burton Park. So literally on one side of the power line, you're in an Opportunity Zone, the other side you're not. And uh, yeah, they don't let you jump across the street and say that's close enough either. It really is bound to the census track. Did you mention something about job incubation as well? Just meant that that was uh, one topic that I suspect we'll talk about okay. this year in our strategic planning uh, session. We've actually uh, engaged in, on a, a little bit of a feasibility study. It just in talking, workforce is becoming such a huge issue. Right. I mean, real estate is the number one issue, number one thing that kind of gets you past the checklist. But if you don't have the workforce to support it, and we're we're starting to discover that that's starting to edge us out just because the demographics um, is perceived that we don't have the sheer numbers to support some of the industries that's gotten so competitive. And like I mentioned in the in the meeting, it's like one of the issues is that we lose a lot of our, you know, our most valuable resources every So we're every thinking year we're thinking there's opportunities the to evaluate whether or not uh, facilitating some programs that could help us grow our own. You know, I, I didn't mention this, but it doesn't have to be bricks and mortar. It doesn't have to be new development or redevelopment. An opportunity fund could come in there and buy an existing business as is, and that would be an investment in a opportunity zone. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be digging, digging up streets. It's about bringing new money in. 
creating your jobs. We'll bring you more information on this. As I said, uh, Ron's done an excellent job. He and Lily are going to be working closely together uh, with the EDC or whatever your Joe initials Ed. are, Joe Ed. Uh, but they will be working closely together, especially on the hub zone and the opportunity zone. Any other questions, comments? Mark, Sheila, thank you thank very much. Thank you. thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you, folks. See you. Thank you, Sheila. Good to see you. Mark, is this yours? Yes, sir. What is that, Mike? Well, he's got plenty of except for science. <laughs> <laughs> Ron's going to also introduce this. I'll give up my seat to one of the ladies. <laughs> well, fortunate we've got uh, leadership from the chamber here and, and one of the committees. We've got of course, Lorette's a president, and uh, uh, Tiffany is, is the current chairman, and uh, Cindy was past chairman, and we've got and Andrew? Adrian. Adrian. Uh, sorry, Adrian. Adrian uh, was one of the committee chairs, right? The, yes, of, of the committee was the minority business committee, and so uh, we want to get a report on some of the planning activities that the chamber has been involved in here the past uh, six or eight months and they're at a new point they head in a little new direction thanks ron well just real quick quickly thank you for being being letting us be here we wanted to share this with you because we feel like it also dovetails with your one city program that is now in place and I think doing quite well and making a difference in Jacksonville in our community. But what the chamber did was we wanted to change. We were known as the Minority Business Services Committee. And this is a drum that Adrian has been beating for two or three years. She wanted a different direction. So Cindy jumped in and worked with the committee, like she says, about eight months, and we have developed a diversity and inclusion strategic plan, which will go through 2021, and that plan is going to be carried out by the Chamber's new Business Diversity Council. <clears throat> So we're very excited about this change, excited about what it can do for the chamber and for our community. So as of now, Adrienne is still the chair of the Business Diversity Council. She tried to step away and we said no. So she's still helping us lead the charge. But I'm going to ask Cindy Edwards, because Cindy was instrumental in holding the meetings throughout the community to get us to this plan. So Cindy. Thank you. Um, we. I hope you had a chance to have a copy of the, the plan put before you. Oh, here comes the one. <laughs> one <down. laughs> Sorry. Short people. Can't reach the top of my kitchen cabinet. Um, but this plan was unanimously adopted by the Board of Directors of the Chamber of Commerce in the thir uh, fourth quarter of 2018. Um, purpose being primarily that we recognize the value in building and sustaining diversity across the organization at all levels. Um, I kind of like to say it's uh, an, a culmination, it's an ending and a beginning. It's a culmination and a, and a new start at the same time. It's a culmination of years of steadfast stalwart support and work, as well as a new focused initiative moving forward. Um, the beginning of 2018 at our annual meeting, which by the way, you don't want to miss the next one, it's the 75th annual meeting, it's going to be quite a party. Uh, but at our last annual meeting, I cited the quote, courage is what it takes to stand up and listen, and courage is also what it, uh, to stand up and speak, but courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. And this year, um, in 2018, the chamber leadership and chamber members did both. And so we came together for a series of listening sessions. We asked our neighbors and community members to come in and talk to us. We met with business owners and educators and faith leaders and just a variety of folks from the community, um, members and non-members, who would give us some honest appraisals. Of basically, you know, kind of a SWOT assessment. But what are we doing well? Where do we really smell? What can we do better? What's not right? What, what's missing? What do you want to see? What do you envision in the future? And gave um, a space for those conversations to happen and then just, you know, had the courage to listen to each other and talk about some really important ideas. 
And um, that generated a lot of ideas, um, strategies, goals, suggestions, all of which ended up becoming the heart of the strategic plan that we're now implementing in 2019. Um, my goal, a hope for this, is that it becomes a living document. That as the initial goals are reached, new goals are set, and we can track progress against this for quite some time and keep it as a forefront um, item for the chamber across the board. And as you already heard, the Minority Services Committee's name was changed to Business Diversity Council. And with that name change also, as Lorette mentioned, um, that group of individuals is now the liaisons for this plan across the organization. So the effort is not only to make sure that we are doing outreach and education and providing opportunities to increase the diversity in the organization at all levels so that we represent our, our beautifully diverse community that we live in, but that we also have um, an effort to stop working in silos in that, and that instead of putting this group of people over here and this group of people over here and attacking problems individually, we really truly do integrate and work on solutions together. And so I, I think, you know, all of us are pretty proud that we've reached the point where we actually have a working document now and are moving forward. And step one is share the plan. So guess what? Here we are to share the plan. Uh, but I would be pleased, as well as the other ladies that are here, if you have questions about the plan or what we're doing next, feel free to lob to us. We'll do the best we can to answer those. Thank we're you. just excited <laughs> <laughs> to be here. Um, we're excited to have this living document and um, to be here to bring it and present it to y'all so that we can spread the word and get this initiative active and uh, rolling. So, thank you. Um, one of the questions, do you, does the SCORE actually work with the Chamber? Do you all have a SCORE, which is a mentoring program yeah, for veterans? We do, not, we do not have active SCORE here, but uh, we have relationships with SCORE that's down in Wilmington, and they have uh, been up here before, but as far as having a chapter, we do not at this point. <clears throat> I was going to ask... Um, Concerning your uh, diversity council, how are or how were your members recruited and selected? The, the business diversity council is right now we're working with the existing members of the committee, but we're trying to get away from the committee structure. Mm -hmm. We're discovering that these business people, especially small business owners, mm -hmm. they don't have time to come to the meeting the second Tuesday of every month and set and go around the room and talk. What I think was, uh, and Cindy said this very well, that what we heard, they want action. Mm -hmm. These, uh, whether minority owned businesses or other small businesses in our community, they want to be a part of action. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to figure out right now. So the days of monthly meetings are gone. Mm -hmm. The days of action are going to start. And um, I'm going to refer, because I like just little nuggets, mm -hmm. But page seven, um, we talk about beginning the implementation of this plan. So the big thing is, our, as Cindy says, our communications plan. That's why we're here today, to gain your encouragement, your support, your endorsement, whatever the council is comfortable with. And uh, we're going to do some surveys. We're going to follow back around with these uh, various business owners that sat down, took the time to tell us what they thought, what was lacking, what they need. We're going to survey them. And then we're going to come back together. OK, here's what they're saying. How do we do it? So again, um, I'm trying not to go all the way to the 2021. So I'm trying to stay focused on what we're going to be doing in the immediate future. But. Uh, I think Adrian will be happy to say the day of committee meetings are over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not open to late individuals of the community? Anyone. Anyone. Yeah. Because yeah. that's we're going to bring people together and talk mm -hmm. and talk about what we can do. So yeah, it's open to anyone. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as Cindy said, we're talking to members and non-members. We're more interested in hearing from the business community because everybody's either a chamber member or a potential chamber member. Is it a conflict of interest for council members? Absolutely not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
as a small business owner. And we come today because as uh, Cindy was mentioning, working in silos, we want to work together. And I know the city has lots of efforts going on with the One City campaign, and we just think that we can work in conjunction together to help facilitate our plan, but also to help push the One City program forward as well and work together as a community just so that the chamber is a part of the community and not a separate entity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could see some synergy between those opportunity zones, those hub zones, and move forward to build this. She's just down the hall. Right. <laughs> yeah. It just sort of seemed like uh, one of those divine appointment moments. It all came together at the right time following the initial year of the One City campaign, other conversations that were happening internally and externally, just sort of all fell into place that this was the time. And so we took some action and we'll keep moving with it. Hey man, what you got started? <laughs> plan looks good. I mean, it's a plan. I mean, like Lorette says, don't get focused on too far out, but right. uh, hit it the obstacle at a time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the uh, good job. Thank you for the picture. That's, yeah. a, well, that's a nice, nice view of the fountain. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Our developer. Oh, sweet. Mm -hmm. yes. But yeah, and uh, Ron does have a copy of that, and I am going to give a shout out to Ron. Um, his support of this document and his encouragement has really, really meant a lot to us because he has shared some wisdom with me about what this could mean, but more importantly, what it would mean if we didn't do something like that. And that was just as valuable. So, Ron, I appreciate that a lot. I've got an electronic version. If anybody wants, yeah. I can forward it to you. If you could email that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's it. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for coming. All right. We're going to go ahead and uh, take a recess. <laughs>
tonight put some new stuff on it. And still got me some time with the car. Got a brand new one, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what time you get? Okay. We're going to go back in session with our next item. This time what we'd like to do is ask Wally, who's our public services director, to continue a dialogue that we've been having uh, for probably the last year regarding uh, wastewater issues. We also have William Brown, who's our uh, wastewater director out at the LTS with us tonight. So William, thank you very much for being here. Wally, please. Mayor, Council, good evening. I'm going to follow up on a discussion that Greg actually started. This will be our, our third session talking about um, our wastewater collection and treatment systems. Um, tonight I'll just quickly review some of the things we've talked about, talk about our, our systems, some of the challenges we uh, currently face, and then some of the initiatives that we've been working on since the updates that Greg gave you. And then We'll have some follow-up meetings as a result of what we talk about tonight. Mm -hmm. So real quickly, our, our wastewater collection system consists of two primary components. One is the collection system itself, which are uh, gravity mains, force mains, and wastewater pump stations. We have just under 300 miles of uh, sewer pipe in the, in the city. Um, and ironically, we have right around another 300 miles of sewer pipe at our land treatment site, which is our wastewater treatment plant. But we have 230 miles of gravity sewers. We have 46 city-owned pump stations. Um, we have a few more that are private that pump into our system, but we don't own or operate those. Um, and we have 42 miles of force mains. Um, our wastewater is treated by uh, at one of two places. Um, the majority of our wastewater goes to the land treatment site, as you're well aware of. But we do have a small portion in the Pine Green area that goes through Omwasa to uh, the base's wastewater treatment, plate, uh, treatment plant aboard Camp Lejeune. So just graphically, this is kind of what our system looks like. The blue shows city limits. Uh, the arrows kind of all point to one area. That would be the main pump station. So uh, the bulk of our wastewater in the city is collected, brought to the main pump station right there near uh, Quartz Plus on 17, and then it's pumped uh, roughly seven miles uh, through a 36-inch force main to the land treatment site, which is highlighted in green. And then... Going back, we also have this one little small area, kind of in the Piney Green area, that goes down Piney Green Road through Omwasa's system to the base, and the, the base is located uh, down off French's Creek. So some of the challenges we face in our collection system are basically a cause of how the city has developed over time. Uh, you know, the city wasn't built all at once with it master planned out. It's grown incrementally over time. And some of the challenges we face is some of those gravity sewers that were installed years ago are really running close to capacity now, especially when we look at um, inflow and infiltration from wet weather that gets into our pipes. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, 46 pump stations. Well, those 46 pump stations also have limited capacity. Uh, the capacity of those stations are limited by either the depth of the wet well, the size of the wet well, the wet well or the size of the pumps and number of pumps that are in the wet well. So if we wanted to upgrade a station because of development pressure, we can't always just pull the pumps that are in there out and put larger pumps in. Many times the wet well size or the wet well depth causes us challenges also. So unfortunately, those are things that we are continually working around and, and trying to deal with and plan for as we meet growth, um, as, as we're trying to meet growth needs. Um, another thing is growth pressure itself. Uh, growth, the city doesn't necessarily control growth and it can happen in various areas. And one thing that we've planned for, or an area that we've been planning for, may take longer to grow out because of 
factors that we're not aware of or land that's available, or as Joe Ed just talked about, incentives in other areas. So we're always planning for growth and looking at growth, and I'm going to show you something in just a few moments of um, how that can be difficult. And then I mentioned inflow and infiltration, and that's basically rainwater, stormwater, or groundwater that gets into our system. Unfortunately, once it gets into our wastewater system, we have to treat it as wastewater. We've got to take it out to the land treatment site and treat it. So we're always trying to keep water out of our system that shouldn't be there. Um, this, you've seen this map before. This basically shows you our existing system with current flow under a 25-year storm. So really the purpose is to, to just highlight under wet weather flow, we already have challenges with our existing system. And I, you know, I, I talked with Greg a lot about, well, what does the 25-year storm mean? And I'm not sure that I completely understand. I get one of two different definitions. One is you have a one chance in 25 years of that storm, that size storm hitting the area, or the other is each storm has a one in 25 chance of producing that much rainfall. Um, I kind of go with the latter because that seems to, <laughs> to be more of what we've seen. If you look at Hurricane Florence, that was classified as a one in thousand year storm. And we can think of about, I can think of about three in the time I've been here. Floyd, Matthew, and then Florence. So, you know, it's, I, I think the one in a thousand chance is probably more, a, a better classification than one in a thousand years. And one thing I, before you leave that, a 25 year storm, we probably have 25 to 30 of those every year. I would agree. It's a matter of intensity. <laughs> it's a matter of intensity of the storm and the time period of the storm. That's right. Um, another, you, you'll notice on this map that there's different colors. We basically have eight major basins that make up our collection system. At the bottom of each of those basins, we have a major pump station. All the water, wastewater in that basin flows to that pump station, and then it pumps over to the main pump station. So we have basically two classifications. We have four of our basins where we have the potential for nominal growth. We're not saying it couldn't happen, but most of the property is developed. You know, there are areas for potential redevelopment, but in order for additional wastewater to get into that basin, it would more than likely be moved or pumped into that basin from another location. An example of that is the main pump station. Um, there is some nominal growth in the main pump station because um, there are stations that don't go through one of our major stations to get there. You know, it could actually come through Bears Pump Station on Belfork Road, which is not really one of our large stations or major stations, but that one goes directly to the main pump station. And then we have pump stations that are in, or basins, that we see uh, higher potential for growth. And the two I'm going to talk about tonight is the Henderson Drive and Basin and the Brookview Basin. And we've talked about both of these before, but I'm just going to highlight a few things. Um, the Henderson Basin, we already see issues of heavy rain during uh, storms uh, in that basin. We have roughly about, you know, you can see the, the light purple shows the developed portions of the ba basin. The dark purple as circled kind of shows uh, areas we've identified that could be easily served but is vacant. So those are undeveloped within the basin. And then there's some areas that we've highlighted that are future. So if you look at those numbers, we have roughly 330 acres of undeveloped land in the Henderson Drive Basin that could be easily developed and connect into uh, the collection system served by Henderson Pump Station. We also have 680 acres of future that could be served by that basin, totaling roughly 700,000 gallons a day based on the state's 2T rules. So what, what gets the state's 2T rules? I have no idea what 2T stands for. That's just what they call them. <laughs> so they use, basically they say a, a home with two bedrooms would be 240 gallons a day. A home with three bedrooms would be 360 right. gallons a day. So we just applied those rules and for commercial property 
it's so many gallons per acre. So we just applied those rules to looking at the zoning of the property and trying to figure estimate the amount of gallons that we could potentially serve. Um, but what's interesting is we have two areas kind of on the top left of the map that we've identified as future areas. We have so seen preliminary plans on at least one of those tracks. Um, and it's very likely that those will start moving forward in the very near future. So although we didn't identify that as one of the um, undeveloped parcels within the basin, you can see that development pressure may drive those to develop before, say, even the, the Tommen track, which kind of sits right off the bypass. So we, it's very hard. I wish I had a good crystal ball to project, project where growth will be and the, where we will see the growth. But those are two very real uh, developments that are likely to move forward in the next um, short time frame. What are those areas zoned as? Right now they're zoned uh, residential and both we've seen would be residential. I don't remember whether they're, you know, RE20 or RS7. So, but both have proposed single family and I know the one north of Ramsey Road was looking at larger lot sizes and they were trying to do uh, low density development, which goes back to the stormwater discussions we've had previously. In the Brookview Basin, uh, we actually have 790 acres of undeveloped property within the basin. That's kind of delineated by that pink color, I guess I would call it. Uh, we, and on top of that, we have a, another 850 acres of future development. And uh, Mr. Tony Sides has ar already purchased um, what was previously known as the Vineyards or Cypress Creek off of Gum Branch Road, and he is working with Parker's and Associates now to put forward a, um, a preliminary plan to develop that site, um, which, again, comes back to being able to predict growth in that area. So the total we estimate, and I think most of this was residential, um, is somewhere around 1.1 million gallons per day that we would need to serve in this area. So over these two basins, we, they're definitely the areas where we're seeing the highest growth potential, but you're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 million gallons through the uh, collection system. If you go back to the map I showed you a minute ago, these are the two basins we're talking about with all that red and yellow in the middle of it under our current flows. <clears throat> Is this the justification for the cross-country rooting of the proposed new soil? You're about five slides ahead of me, but I will get there. Okay, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so we also have challenges in treating the wastewater. So I said that we have two, really two places that we send our wastewater. One is to the um, wastewater treatment plant in Camp Lejeune. That's really minor. We only send... Um, I think it's less than 100,000 a day there now. Uh, we have the capability of sending somewhere close to a million gallons a day. Um, we also have a 9 million gallon per day permitted land treatment site, and that's where we send the majority of our wastewater. Uh, LTS sits on 7,500 acres of land. Uh, as you very well know, it's primarily forested uh, and it's pine trees, loblolly pine. And we have um, 720 million gallons of storage, which sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, especially when it's full. So the only way that we can dispose of the wastewater, the final treatment, is to irrigate the forest, irrigate our across our 7,500 acres, and we have 21,000 sprinklers to do that. But and again, you've seen this graphic before, but that really causes some challenges during periods of wet weather. And while 2018 was kind of an anom anomaly, we had, you might as well just say 113 inches of rainfall during 2018. But not only does the wet weather affect us with 
um, rain through inflow and infiltration that we talked about directly into the lagoons. I mean, if, if you think about 113 inches directly raining into the, our lagoons, um, we store 52 million gallons per foot. So I'm not great at math, but I would argue that that's somewhere around eight, nine feet. Mr. Thomas, mm -hmm. you seem to be the expert. <laughs> so somewhere around nine feet and times 52 million gallons. So that was rainfall. That was water we took, never went through our system, came out of the sky right into our lagoons. And we have to treat as wastewater. The problem is when it rains in town, and most of the time rains at land treatments, land treatment site. So unfortunately, when it's raining, we can't irrigate. And one of the major problems is it may rain today, and we can't irrigate today. But if field conditions are wet, we can't irrigate tomorrow either, or possibly the following day. I'll let media take care of that one. <laughs> but we, so wet weather causes us a lot of problems. And what it does is it causes us to store and once we start storing and we get near the top, one of the things we're forced to do is emergency spray, which we're actually emergency spraying now because of Hurricane Florence and the 30 inches of rain she brought. And we already weren't in great standing because of the wet weather we had had through August, September, October, and November, and unfortunately December too. Um, so we're currently holding a lot of water and the only way to get it out is to irrigate it but when we can't irrigate we have to store until we can't store anymore and then we have to irrigate so I put in there that we had lost irrigation days of 105 days that doesn't necessarily mean that we had 105 days of rain could have been that it rained one day and we lost two days because of it or it rained a week and we lost you know two or three days after that because of field conditions. But I would argue that that number is artificially low. 105 sounds like a lot, but when you take into consideration emergency spraying, which means we have to spray regardless of field conditions, we've actually been spraying since Christmas on days we wouldn't have otherwise been able to spray. Uh, and we were in emergency spraying shortly after Florence too. So that 105 days, if you look at last year where we didn't emergency, emergency spray as many days, we were actually in the 120 range for lost days. So wet weather really creates challenges in our land treatment. And just to stay on that, we've talked about, well, is more storage really help us or, or solve the problem? And if you look at that, it really doesn't. What it does is prolong how long before we have to go into emergency spraying because once it's full, we have to spray it too. So these are things that we are continually battling and trying to find ways to overcome. No work. I have faith. So when you, when you discuss emergency spraying, you measure the uh, the amount of pollution that's being discharged we as have, compared to normal? When we emergency spray, we have sp special parameters in our um, permit, and we have to creek sample daily. Okay, Whereas otherwise, it is weekly? Quarterly. Quarterly. Mm -hmm. I would suspect during Florence, pollution <laughs> by dilution, that it wasn't <laughs> that much of a problem for the environment when you were doing emergency spraying. And quite frankly, we have, in all of the emergency spraying, we have never had a negative creek sample. So we sample all around the site. And mm -hmm. even in the periods where we're emergency spraying, at one point we were spraying 24 hours a day. And we never had a negative creek sample. Many, um, many times our water that we spray is of higher quality than the water that's in the water bodies. And we actually have a, an initiative with NC State right now for looking at how well our system does at treating. And um, one of the last things that we looked at, it actually shows that um, the water around our site has a greater number of chemicals 
and the wastewater coming into our site has a greater number of chemicals than actually is downstream of us, which means that the site is doing what it's supposed to in filtering that out. Part of the study that NC State is doing is going to be essential in possibly getting uh, what I will call uh, reductions in our permit. If we can show through the NC State studies that the ground is in fact cleansing the stormwater, I'm sorry, the wastewater more than what the permit assumed, then we can have some relief in that permit. So we come back to how do we meet all of these challenges? And we have roughly five or six things that we're really focused on right now. And I'm not going to read those to you. What I'm going to do is talk a little bit more about those. Um, we'll start with inflow and infiltration. That affects both capacity in our system and capacity at the plant. Um, we did our first inflow and infiltration project in 2007. And that was actually done as part of our special order consent by the state um, when we had uh, treatment challenges. Um, if you remember, we were limited to the amount of development we could allow um, based on the amount of sewer that we could treat. And one of the remedies was to focus on inflow and infiltration. And since 2007, we have continued that initiative. We currently have a project on Henderson Trunk Sewer. If you drive down Gumbridge Road and you look over to the right, um, kind of in the area of the Pizza Hut Ducks, if you look down into that uh, ravine, you can actually see a manhole that we've raised, and we've raised it about four feet. And we did that because the, the manholes were at ground level, but as the creek came up, they actually submerged the manholes, which created I&I. &I. Um, the, the, the water would actually flow directly into the system through some of those submerged manholes. So we have that project underway. Um, I will tell you that every time we talk to the state, whether it's to report, you know, a minor sewer spill or to talk about where we are with the land application site and emergency spraying, the, it may not be the first thing, but it comes up in every discussion. What are you doing about your inflow and infiltration? And from what I hear, we're not the only ones they ask that question of, but it comes up literally every time we talk to the state. Whether that's me or Gavin or William. How come they don't know what we're doing? I mean, how, come they're not, well, how come they don't write it down? <laughs> we, we've had some conversations about that. <laughs> we, um, we've actually talked about providing them a report to explain what all we've accomplished. Um, but, it, you know, that just goes to show you the importance of trying to address inflow and infiltration. So we have some upcoming inflow and infiltration projects. You'll see these in the capital improvement plan. Um, we're going to look at the triangle area where the mobile home park used to be. Uh, we're going to look at the Wantland uh, Basin. It's kind of a small basin, but it's in downtown, and we have had a lot of issues in that area. And then we're going to look at the Sherwood Basin, which is kind of over behind Dunkin' Donuts. Um, we have a little pump station over there. And... Those, the Wantland and Sherwood Basins are ones that our staff has found issues in as they have been doing their camera work that's required per our permit. So we have those projects upcoming. And before you leave I&I, &I, we know that in the past we've talked to you about Holiday City. Holiday City is doing their own I&I &I work on their system. Uh, we are monitoring that on a regular basis. We believe that once that work is finished, that we will have substantially addressed through their money, not through city money, the I and I that's coming from that uh, mobile home park. They've just completed a study, and their their engineer is uh, putting together their recommended course of action now. All right. Also, uh, I talked about how we plan for growth and plan for our future. Um, and how we handle the additional wastewater capacity. This map shows you, this map comes from our model, and each of those projects that you see circled are recommended improvements that are going to be necessary in order to meet the 20-year growth projections that we've provided. Now, 
again, I go back to, I wish I had a great crystal ball, um, but that it's based off of um, every time we've talked to a developer uh, about a parcel, what the likelihood of that parcel is to develop, what the proposed uses were, um, what the zoning is. So we've tried to identify and um, quantify all of the development around the city's core system. And to Mr. Bittner's question, this is the um, Northwest Trunk Sewer, um, Northwest Regional Trunk Sewer. Um, the idea behind this would be that we in upgrade gravity sewer that extends up to Western Boulevard, bring it to a new pump station and take the force main directly out to the land treatment site. This project is um, completely designed. We have all but one easement acquired. And based off our latest model run, it actually says that we have um, slightly more time than we were expecting. Um, although the <laughs> Cypress Creek track will um, present us with some challenges that we'll need to look at but that we may be able to co construct it in phases. But I think the important thing to note is the difference between this slide and the previous slide. If you look at the, the core of the system, kind of all in here, by installing this, we eliminate all of those upgrade projects that we would have otherwise had to have done. Um, and in addition, this gives us the opportunity to address additional future growth above what we planned for. So let me, I don't think I was clear on that. You were mentioning the Cypress Creek, that proposed development there. Would that tie into the system as it is? Yes, sir. So the Cypress Creek track kind of sits right in here, and it would tie in right here. And you can see that these that we will have to address all of these projects and here not as a result of just that project but other development in that area that basin actually extends down just about to carolina forest so there's still a large area of western boulevard uh, between carolina forest and gum branch road that is yet to be yet to be developed you know, the, the Palisades sit in there, and, um, and then as you get closer, you have the church that's currently under construction. But there's still quite a bit of vacant property along Western Boulevard that would also come to that same location. And here, this is where that property sits. Well, we, there's no plan that's been submitted or anything for this yet, right? The, um, I actually have a call from Jason House and Parker and Associates today to talk about that you have project. Any idea of the size? Um, I don't have the number of units. In our previous discussions, uh, they're looking at somewhere around 300 single-family units. All right. So, what does that equate to as addition to the system? Um, well, 300 times. 360. <clears throat> I'm trying. It's, that's, I think, something I've noticed, and Greg mentioned it one time briefly. Your allocation rarely equals your actual usage. usage. That is true. You know, because your house, when you say it's 240 times a month, that's going to be about 7,500 gallons. Well, how many people really use 7,500? How many houses? Mm -hmm. Very few. I would like to know if you could sometime when you have time, no rush, but go back and say, take a time period we allocated a million gallons and see what the, what you really get from your allocation. There's, there's going to be a percentage less. There is. And, and we've I, actually looked at that. Oh, we so have that somewhere? We do. For a single family house, we've found that we're somewhere between 240 and, 300, uh, and 260 versus the 360 by the state. They put, a, they put a safety factor in. That's right. Uh, obviously. Well, it's so, easy for us to do is take a billing route 
uh, for water for your water and sewer bill. Take a billing route and figure out, you know, pick a number. It has 200 houses on the billing route. Right. And, what's, and what's we can show you what the actual flow right. water consumption, because obviously we don't measure wastewater, we measure uh, the sale of water. We can show you the actual sale of water for those 100 homes versus the theoretic flow for those 100. It'd be very easy to do. And we did the one we did it before we did it and it was we looked at Carolina Force and the number was between 240 and 260. That's the reason why uh, Wally mentioned a while ago we when we the more we have studied this we have found that we have a little bit more time and a little bit more cushion. That's right. But there will come a point where that time and cushion will evaporate and obviously you don't build infrastructure of this nature in a short period of time. Now, what's been beneficial, and, and we won't show this to you tonight, but in the days ahead, we will. What's been beneficial is that by not having to go out for the debt at the time we originally thought, it has been able, we have been able to prolong the investment, still have reasonable growth out there, but the day is coming when we're going to have to make some decisions. And I think Wally is getting ready to show you one of the short-term decisions that is going to help us uh, not with this project, but with overall capacity. You ready to move to Bryn Mawr? Sure. Before we, you leave we, that, back, the Cy Cypress Creek piece there, when they originally were going to build that uh, project there, did we annex that at that time? Yes, yeah. it is already part of city limits. We, we've had two plans presented to us we on, have, that, on yeah. that same yeah. property, yes. and this is the lowest number I've heard as far as the number of homes. The others were close to a thousand we were talking about. So, so when, when are you planning on uh, putting this out for bid? You said it was already designed, just lacking one one easement. We are. The, the latest model that we ran actually said that we could construct this in phases. And while that sounds odd, the first phase would be this phase right here. It comes down. Mm -hmm. And the reason we would be able to do that is because there's an existing gravity trunk sewer that runs along that route. And what we could do is actually upgrade that existing trunk sewer. And it leads to an existing trunk sewer. The, the Brookview pump station is somewhere in that area. And that gravity sewer comes in turns like that. So it's conceivable that we could construct that first portion and address a lot of these issues because that line is one of the, the challenging lines um, if you look at our overall model. And normally you would build the line from the yeah. LTS back, back to the city. Yes. Uh, because of existing <clears throat> conditions, you have the option to build that first leg that you normally think of as being the last leg. So yes. you got time. What do you what do you think you've gained, gained time wise, or when do you think you when do you think you need to have that build out? We are based on the projections from Cypress Creek. What we'll do is take it and rerun our model. Okay, I didn't know if you'd already Try done that. We have not done that yet. Okay. That's what we will okay. do. Okay, no, yes. I don't not, want to answer it then to you. Yeah. you do well, it, it would not surprise me if we have a couple of years because, as you know, being in the development business, okay, the gentleman's bought the property. He's platting it. Haven't turned one blade of dirt yet, haven't put in any infrastructure yet, haven't built the first home. A piece of property of that size, most likely from the time that the plats approved and they actually are ready to start building homes, you're probably going to have anywhere from 12 to 18 months of field work in order to get all the infrastructure in there. And then, a, you know, a project in Jacksonville of 300 homes depends on your consumption model. You might get built out 300 homes in seven years if the economy stays strong. It might be 10 or more years, depending on the economy. And of course, if the base suddenly announced that they were going to add X number of personnel, it could make that consumption model go much quicker. I think the, the good news that we're seeing is we are going to be able to build it in phases. And I think you're going to find when Gail brings you back some of the financial information, that we are going to be able to, you know, have some latitude. Yes. We won't have to borrow. We won't have to borrow as much, hopefully. And it will only borrow, uh, you know, ten times what we need, not eleven <laughs> times, right? <laughs> Which is good. But if the figures you gave me, 
it's it's still not much sewage to be generated. What eighty five thousand gallons or so? Yes. Okay. Drop in a proverbial bucket. <laughs> but how does the capacitors? You're leading up to this, and I'm wondering how do the like new capacity charges figure into this? The you're talking about the system development fees. Yes. yes. The system development fees actually take into everything uh, that is currently in our capital improvement plan. So it does take into consideration the improvements and the Western Regional Trunk Sewer. It does? It does, yes, sir. And it takes in everything that we have planned out for the next 10 years is included in our current fee. Okay, back to Brent Park. One of our other initiatives is looking at redirecting um, approximately 1.1 million gallons per day from the Bryn Mawr Basin. I mentioned that we do have nominal treatment through the BASE's uh, wastewater treatment facility. Uh, we currently have an agreement for up to 1 million gallons. Um, this would um, basically take all of that and, and possibly more. Uh, but uh, we're currently working on a feasibility study. We hope to have this finished up in the next month or so. So we plan to have it back to you in the next couple of months for you to review. Uh, as part of that, we will evaluate multiple force main routes. Um, I've seen six, so I don't know how many we'll end on. Um, but it's everything from going up Corbin Road, uh, across uh, Northeast Creek, and down Hemlock, and then tying into our pump station at uh, Poplar, all the way the other direction down Corbin to 24 and straight to the base. Um, and then we've actually looked at several routes across the creek right there at Brimmar. So we will evaluate multiple routes. We'll look at the, the cost benefit of um, the projects that we would not have to do as a result of this project. Um, and that was something that was brought up by council when we uh, originally talked about this was making sure that we included a cost benefit analysis as part of that study. So the idea behind this is not only does it free up space in our collection system, um, admittedly it is in an area with nominal growth, but um, it does have challenges in that basin uh, all around the Ellis pump station and the lines leading up to the Ellis pump station. But it also relieves pressure on the main pump station. One of the major projects that it would um, take out of the main pump station in that our model identified for future was another EQ basin, which was significant cost. EQ stands for? Sorry, equalization, uh, equalization basin. Uh, basically a wastewater storage tank for periods where a system can't handle all of the flow. One of the important things about this project is that we begin to use the capacity that the base is set aside. The base's plant, I believe, is 15, 15 million gallons, million. and yep. their flow is substantially less than that. We have talked in the past about, well, the base won't give you any more capacity. Well, the right the answer is, why should they? Not We're not right. using what you have already. We believe that as you look at the growth of the community, uh, you know, you're going to have to figure out how do we expand truly to 9, 10, 11, 12 million gallons? And the answer is multiple treatment facilities. If you start sending a million gallons to the base and you're actually sending it and paying them for it, then you can negotiate maybe for another million. And when you use that, maybe another million. The important thing is it gives you, uh, once you start using it, it, it really gives you the leverage to negotiate more capacity with them. And the more capacity you can send to the base, the less capacity you have to send to the LTS. Do you think there's any possibility once we do get some flow going that we can look at the rates? Because my understanding of the rates there are disadvantaged or disadvantaged with the rates we have to pay. The yeah. base has already said that they are willing to look at the rates. Okay. But you, you do make a good point. The current rate is based upon not just treatment, <clears throat> it's based upon operating their full collection system. You know, you think of the system. 
you have the treatment plant, you have lift stations, you have right. collection sure. lines. Two. The rate that they're currently charging is for all three components. And we're providing two of the three. And what we, that's correct. Under the under the negotiation, what we would want is to pay the treatment cost only. Right. So we're we're responsible for conveyance. They're just exactly. Treating. We're doing that anyway. All yes. Right. That's I know right. that's because when they set the rate, they really didn't have, they don't understand their costs. They don't have to. That's they right. Just, they just operate. They use, so they, just, they, they looked went out at, and I said, what do you charge? What that's do you right. Charge? They look at local they rates. They look at other, yeah. right. So you look at retail rates. rates. They're, they're, they look at our rates and our rates bundle it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's as right. As long as we're looking at that, then it's a little more. And the base is actually very excited about the opportunity. Um, there, we work directly with um, their management staff over the facility. And one of the things they've talked about us um, is that, you know, most of their wastewater is industrial type wastewater. They want the residential wastewater to dilute down their industrial. Um, and basically what their operating staff has said is, even though their plant is permitted at 15 million gallons a day, at their the current wastewater strength and composition, they probably wouldn't see but close to 11. So they are looking for the, you know, diluted wastewater, you know, the, the residential type wastewater that we have. So we haven't sent anything down to that, or that connection. Just from the, the shopping Washington. center on? Just the, just the one shopping center at Highland Force. Island the Crossing. Line and that's going that's to the base. base. That is yes. going to the base, yes, sir. Along and with um, Wasatch flow. Yeah. And well, how, much, point how, much, how much do but we're paying for that. more flow than what's we're yeah. generating? Yes. Along Wasatch. Why is that? Why are we doing that? Our share of the cost of the pump station is based on that flow, and we're not generating that flow. Neither is on Wasatch, so we're. we're uh, <coughs> right. We're actually subsidizing the operation. So all we're sending there is from the shopping center? That's correct. But remember, if uh, Patriot Park yes. is ever developed, and that was one of the justifications. Yes. So okay. uh, we only have a couple of minutes. So Wally, any other points you want to make very quick? Sure. Uh, one of the other initiatives we'll be coming to talk to you in the very near future is looking at um, other disposal options. Now, I mentioned that storage may not necessarily be the answer. So one of the things we've done is a desktop study of um, soils and vacant parcels kind of in the general vicinity of the land application site. Uh, we had a um, environmental, I guess he was a hydrologist, look at um, several areas and he's developing us a report and he found a couple of uh, parcels with suitable soils, and he thinks that we could look at um, somewhere in the vicinity of four to six million gallons per day of treatment through infiltration basins. Basically percolation. So Which is what on is used what is now what, at, at, at Richland. So. That is correct. And um, of course, you know, the one thing that we want to be careful with is timing, because we're still not using our full capacity, but in addition, um, land is something that they're not making more of. So if we do find specific areas that um, are capable of having future treatment, it may some, be something that we need to talk about now to at least reserve for the future. Well, then the other part, uh, we, we want to always stress while we talk about the facility being a 9 million gallon facility, it's not. It's only a 9 million gallon facility when everything is theoretically working the way it's supposed to work. But when you have as much as, as much rain as we have and all of the weather issues of, of um, spraying, we really are going to have to look. That's why the Bryn Mawr, you know, before we were talking primarily about building the Northwest Passage. Now we're suggesting that we bring Bryn Mawr online earlier because it gives us more options. Real quickly summarize. Uh, the, the last thing I think I want to take away from this slide is there was a sixth thing that I put up there that I didn't really talk about in the previous slide, and that's the time frame of implementation. Uh, you know, we recognize that we need to plan for the future. 
The problem is we can't burden our, our ratepayers to do it all right now. So what we're trying to do is strategically plan these, and that's where the, you know, making sure that we follow up with our models and we plan for the future and we look at what our system is doing. But in addition, we need to be aware because we don't want to find ourselves where we were back in 2007, where we had growth that far outweighed what we could support, which is why we have developments that should be in city limits that didn't come to the city. So we want to prevent being there again. You know, we want to avoid a moratoriums like other communities have faced, but we recognize that we need to have multiple approaches and we need to um, take those in the time frame that they're necessary. And with that, we will be back before you in the next couple of months to talk about um, the two studies that I, I talked about, one is the Bryn Mawr, and the other is the uh, infiltration basin areas. Uh, so you'll probably be seeing me. You know, I apologize that Greg's not here. So, but I've got my brain trust William over there, so we're, we're absolutely fine. <laughs> and with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I have one outstanding slide if there aren't any other questions. See it. See how outstanding it is. All right. The um, Mr. Bittner asked for an update on Blue Frog, and I'll do this real quickly. We did the uh, pilot project in 2016. Uh, it has been in place and operating since then. The only thing we've done is kind of rearrange them a little bit. Uh, what we found is that we did not meet the original pilot project. Um, goal of reducing the sludge by 23 percent or so we actually saw a reduction but it was closer to 17 percent that said what we saw was that the um, ph was improved much more into the range where the pine trees like them uh, the wastewater was not as strong and um, that we had um, they were easier to maintain and operate. They don't get clogged like the others do. Um, we talked about possible savings in power consumption. Based on the way the site operates, I really can't say that I've noticed any power consumption um, savings, but we've also implemented trains one and three now. We actually installed those a year ago. We started, installed them in February of 2018. Um, <laughs> We've only had one good season, which is kind of the summer months where the wastewater is warmer to, to see any sludge digestion. We really haven't noticed any yet that we can speak of. However, William can tell you that he has seen a redistribution in the sludge that is out there. So, and we did see that with train two before things started to, they, before it seemed to start taking care of itself. Um, that said, what we plan to do is at the end of the season this year, so probably around the fall, you know, October, November timeframe, we'll probably look at another sludge survey. And at that time, we'll be able to come back and report to you um, whether those have been successful or not. But for all intensive purposes, whether they reduce the sludge or not, there has been, they have been successful because we are getting better results out of our wastewater and our pH levels. So that's all I have. All right, anybody got anything else before we adjourn? Motion? Motion. 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 Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.